On the morning of September 11, 2001, almost 3,000 people were killed in the deadliest terrorist attack on American soil in U.S. history. Two planes hijacked by Islamic jihadists vowing death to all Americans plowed into both towers at the World Trade Center in New York. Another plane was flown into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and a fourth plane, presumably headed for the White House or U.S. Capitol, was heroically diverted by passengers and ended up crashing into an empty field in Pennsylvania. I'm Stephanie Haney, and in this 9-11 special, we're remembering those lives lost and sharing the ways their memories are being honored across the country, as well as sharing the latest news impacting 9-11 victims and their families. We start with an update on possible punishments for some of the men charged with orchestrating the attack on September 11th. President Biden has rejected a list of proposed conditions sought by the five men who are accused of conspiring to carry out the terrorist attack. In exchange for pleading guilty, the men asked for a maximum punishment of life in prison and to receive care to treat problems from their time in CIA custody, as well as to avoid solitary confinement. Despite the president's rejection of the deal, another offer by military prosecutors that would spare the five men from the death penalty is still on the table. Claudine Ewing spoke with family members of the accused about the letter they received outlining that offer. For many families, the pain of 9-11 seems like yesterday, not nearly 22 years ago. And that's why when they received this letter from the Department of Defense, a letter indicating that five people suspected of coordinating the September 11th attacks, may not face the death penalty under the plea deals being considered, some are simply disappointed. This is a government issue here. This is this is the, the prosecution, this, the United States government that is, I don't know what they're doing. Sounds like they're dropping a ball to me. Attorney Paul Wallier's sister Margaret was killed on 9-11. She grew up in Hamburg. The letter specifically says it is possible that a PTA, that's a pretrial agreement in this case, would remove the possibility of the death penalty at sentencing. Margaret came from a big family, so there's really a bunch of us here um, that have been texting back and forth. The general consensus is, yeah, yes, we definitely don't agree with that. It's basically a disgrace. I mean, after uh, 20 years. Uh, I mean, what's the point of having a federal death penalty if you're not going to use it uh, in a case like this? Basically, 3,000 murders. Um, so we don't understand uh, really where they're coming from. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and four others are held at the U.S. Detention Center in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. We've learned over the years from court proceedings that Mohammed had the idea and presented attacking the U.S. on 9-11 to Osama bin Laden. It's not only that letter that's coming now, it's the 20 years that have gone by. Uh, so it's just a little bit hard to believe. When it comes to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, do you think it's because of all the repeated delays and now they're just thinking that people, you know, they're tired, they just want this over? You have a federal death penalty. And it's passed by Congress. It's uh, been upheld by the United States Supreme Court over and over. Um, so it's... If you have it, why aren't you using it? The PGA Tour and Live Golf, which is the Saudi-funded upstart league, have agreed to merge. And this is causing a lot of controversy. Many people are upset with the move and are pointing to Saudi Arabia's poor human rights record and its ties to the Saudi government on behalf of the people killed in the September 11th terrorist attacks. Eric Flack spoke with the widow of a 9-11 victim who feels betrayed by the Live Golfers and the PGA Tour. We always feel it. It never goes away. Terry Strada blames the Saudi government for helping to orchestrate the 9-11 attacks that killed 3,000 people in D.C., Pennsylvania, and New York, including her late husband, Tom, who worked in the Twin Towers. The Saudi government has denied supporting the 9-11 plot. But Strata says the Saudis got exactly what they wanted with today's deal to merge with the PGA Tour. I am appalled. I am deeply, deeply offended at this news that um, the PGA has just sold their soul to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and sold out on all of the players. Took the high moral ground to say no to live. They're all now owned by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. 
The agreement reportedly reached without the knowledge of most PGA Tour members. Strada believes this is a huge win for those live golfers accused of helping the Saudi government sports wash what Amnesty International calls one of the worst human rights records in the world. Golfers like Bryson DeChambeau, one of the most famous American golfers to sign with Liv for a reported $125 million. I asked him about the criticisms during a recent Liv event in Northern Virginia. When you can talk about ethics, that's people's perception. Um, I mean, I, I completely disagree with, with it, but um, everybody has the right to their own opinion. And I'd say that, was it, was it worth it? Absolutely. This is... Uh, been beyond my dreams. The PGA called the deal a landmark agreement to unify the game of golf on a global basis. PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan adding the partnership is transformational. After two years of disruption and distraction, this is a historic day for the game we all know and love. Just a complete betrayal of our trust and our belief. And the message that it sends to us is that money it means more than morals. It means more than doing the right thing, which is something that my husband always went around the house saying, do the right thing. He always told the kids that. And Jay Monahan has just completely crapped all over it. There's a mobile exhibit making its way around the country to make sure no one forgets the lives lost on 9-11. It's called Tunnels to Towers, and people could see it at Erie County Fair in New York this summer. Alexandra Rios Malvia takes us inside. Everyone that comes in the Tunnels to Towers exhibit, the first thing that they would tell you is that they know exactly where they were and what they were doing on 9-11. So I was in Louisville, Kentucky last year, and this lady walked right in the ramp, walked right up here, and she pointed right here. And I said, ma'am, what, what was that? She said, that, that was my husband's office. And um, unfortunately, he, he lost his life that day. But uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty impactful. Billy Puckett is the field manager for this 9-11 memorial exhibit. He says it was created to bring America back together. We lost 343 firemen that day, 23 Port Authority officers, 37 NYPD officers. On the left side of this plaque, these are the 343 firemen that we lost that day. They are credited with saving well over 30,000 people that day. That, that's incredible. And on the right side, that's 270 people that we lost from 9-11 illnesses. It was not only the single largest loss of life day we've ever had in the United States, but it was also the largest rescue ever as well. Everything in here came from ground zero, including these golf balls that once sat on someone's desk. There's lots of stories in this exhibit. I mean, every, every corner that you go to, there's a different story. This is really, really amazing. The top photo up here in the top left. Stories of American heroes that the Tunnels to Towers Foundation continues to support. This includes today's veterans, first responders, and their families, including Buffalo's very own Jason Arno, who lost his life in the line of duty. Everywhere Billy sets up the 9-11 Memorial exhibit, he is escorted in. It was really, really special. Um, the engine that he was on actually was right in front of me, and I followed it from the mall in here, and um, yeah, it was really, really special. Billy hopes that everyone who walks through their doors never forgets our American heroes. From Most Buffalo, I'm Alexandria Rios Malvia. Throughout this month, a retired flight attendant has been traveling through central Pennsylvania with a beverage cart with a goal to get to Shanksville. His push to go 300 miles in 30 days is his way to honor the crew members and passengers of Flight 93, the people who lost their lives during the 9-11 attacks. Matt Kleindenst caught up with him during his journey to honor those heroes. On a hot August day, the 64-year-old is rolling his way across the Commonwealth with a beverage cart on a journey to honor America's bravest heroes. They'd do it for me. They would do it for me. Absolutely. Polly Venito is walking 300 miles in 30 days from Newark, New Jersey to Shanksville, Pennsylvania to honor the flight attendants and passengers of Flight 93 who died on 9-11. 
He says their actions on that day deserve more recognition. They band together and come up with a plan in split second time. We're going to take these guys. They're not going to do this to us. They were the last line of defense against terrorism that day was these passengers and these crew members on 93. Through the blazing heat, rough gravel and steep hills, Polly keeps moving his feet. 93, 175, 93. With the help of the spirit of heroes. First thing I did on this cart was put their pictures on top of it because I wanted to look at their faces. I feel it coming from these crew members. From them, oh, I get emotional. From them, threw me out. Just, it's crazy. Many of those flight attendants were also his friends. Polly was on flight 175 the night before it crashed into the World Trade Center. After struggling for years with addiction, Polly is also pushing to inspire hope. So many years, I, uh, I was alone with those thoughts. Yeah, I was alone with them. And there's plenty of people in these homes along the street that are that way, too. That message of hope and courage has traveled with him on previous trips to Ground Zero, the Pentagon, and now to Shanksville. Pauly says he wants all of America to honor 9-11's first first responders, the flight attendants and passengers aboard the planes that day. I just hope that I'm, I'm able to give some comfort to the family members left behind and uh, knowing that the public out here and the, really the world knows what their loved one was able to accomplish under those conditions. Matt Kleindens, Fox 43 News. First responders in Georgia and other states are honoring the people we lost in the 9-11 attacks by scaling Stone Mountain. Those firefighters and first responders say it's important to never forget those who died and to pass their memory on to the next generations. Karis Belger spoke to them about their personal reasons to climb. For me, it's, you know, uh, about keeping that oath and when you say you're never going to forget, you don't. Like so many others, firefighter Matthew Rust can never forget September 11th, 2001. Um, I was in high school and remember it being turned on on all the TVs. Um, and just at the end of the day, we're all at home just kind of taking it all in. It's the day, he says, inspired him to put on a uniform similar to the ones worn by hundreds of others 21 years ago. Along with other first responders and their families, Matthew prepared to climb Stone Mountain as a way to remember. The motivation is the same for Deputy Chief Mask. It's, it's more than the event itself. At the end of his hour-long climb, Mask explained the memories of that day are still so clear. It, it hurt me, and you know, as, as well as it hurt the rest of the country. So. It's something I'll never forget in my lifetime. Accompanied by Captain Travis Miller and his bagpipes, the group made their way to the top of the summit for a collective moment of remembrance. I have a cousin uh, through marriage that was under the pile with FDNY and uh, several other friends that were there. And for me, during the day, it's uh, thinking about what they, what they were going through. Despite the gray skies left over from a morning of rain, Captain Miller says the purpose of this climb will be essential for years to come. And so many uh, people that are coming into the fire service and public safety that have never, weren't even alive when September 11, 2001 happened. And so it's important for us to pass this on to the next generations. And by coming up here and bringing them with us. In Stone Mountain, Karis Belger, 11 Alive News. In Texas, hundreds of first responders climbed the Tower of the Americas as a tribute to those who were killed in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. They climbed the stairs inside the tower twice, exceeding the height of the World Trade Center towers. Troy Kless spoke with families about the symbolism of making that climb. Remembering a day that changed everything. Those making the climb remember how 9-11 changed their lives, like McQueenie Fire Chief Michael Weedner. Shortly after, joined the Army, uh, did a buddy program with my buddy, and went straight in. We deployed together. Nine days later, he passed away after being killed in Iraq. And Priscilla Martinez, a San Antonio firefighter's wife, saw that sacrifice firsthand. My mom fought in two wars, and... Uh, she came back, but many of those that we know did not. 2,977 lives ended that day. Martinez is climbing for just a few who were carrying life. So I'm seven months pregnant, and I'm climbing because over 10 people that were pregnant that day, civilians, didn't get to hold their babies. She and her husband, Hector, hold their children. 
and the name of a firefighter killed. His name and 342 others were written on the fire hose carried up and down the Tower of the Americas. Over 500 first responders answered the bell to pay tribute, along the way touching a piece of reclaimed steel from the World Trade Center. Martinez doesn't want her family to forget the sacrifices made. There's fathers that didn't get to meet those babies, and there's firemen that didn't get to meet their babies on the ground. So I think for, for me, that's a, that's a big deal on why I'm climbing today. And every day, Fire Chief Weidner wants people to remember. Pay respect back to them. They gave the ultimate sacrifice. They deserve it. Troy Kless, Ken's Five. In Idaho, a large display to honor and remember those who died on September 11th, 2001 is catching attention in a picturesque spot, drawing in plenty of visitors. Brian Holmes takes us to the largest flying American flag display above the Snake River. No other place like it. It's one of the most scenic and most picturesque parts of Idaho. Yeah, you got the river. And the canyon it carved. The bridge. And those that jump off it. The bottom of that arch. There's even a rock to remember those that tried to jump over it. But this week, there's one more thing to see over the Snake River in Twin Falls. Old glory. In all its glory. I wasn't expecting it to be this big. Stands for freedom, doesn't it? No, it's pretty, pretty impressive. It's like it's hanging there by itself. Except it's not. It was put there by the group Follow the Flag, who took three days to anchor it, hang it, and finally unfurl the largest American flag to ever fly. Hey, how, how big do you think that, that flag really is? Six foot stripes. Um, it's 154 feet long, 78 feet wide. It's over 12,000 square feet. It's a quarter of an acre. I mean, that's bigger than most mansions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I can't imagine the weight, the weight of it. On the scale, it's 400 pounds, but its real weight is relative, considering why is the flag out there? Why it's here. For 9-11. Which is why the reaction to those who walk out here and see it for the first time. I got the goosebumps. It was, it really touches me. Is about what you'd expect. Big goosebumps. I'm not kidding. It's an emotional experience for sure for many who stop by. Standing out there on the bridge, and I thought about 9-11 and how heart-wrenching that was, and said a few words, and still right here. Like Tammy. It's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. Who moved back to Twin Falls to help her dad fight cancer. I haven't been able to leave the house much because I taking care of him and got about a half hour. You could have done anything in this half hour. Why this? Just, um, to be honest, to uh, pray and hope. Does it give you hope? It does. Why? I mean, it's the flag. I mean, I keep going back to that, but I mean, it's, it's the flag. It's certainly enough for Gary. For those people that were lost and to represent freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That chokes you up a bit. Because I'm a veteran, I'm a father, and my grandfather. Last year, my bride and I, our last picture together was right here. She passed away last year. Meanwhile. Oh, so that's what it is. For someone like Malika. It doesn't really mean much to me, to be honest with you given my ancestral history <laughs> you know it's not like oh my god i'm so proud to be an american like no not really but it's cool to look at what does it make you think about it makes me think of my ancestors that were slaves that did all the work literally broke their backs to make this country what it is still not recognized how it should be so i mean that's a lot of years decades centuries to just be broken like that. I mean, it's just a piece of fabric to me, really. But I mean, it's cool to look at. But learning it was stretched across the canyon for 9-11? Yeah, that was rough. Kind of hits home. Lost two family members in there. It was terrible. We couldn't find my uncle for weeks. Weeks. And the whole time he was down there helping people. We thought he was dead. So... That was rough. 
I mean, I understand for other people this must be like the most majestic thing they've ever seen, which is great. That's awesome. But you have mixed feelings. I do. I do. But I mean, you gotta admit it does look cool waving in the wind. And that's only the first thing Kyle hopes people notice when they see it. I hope that people, you know, have a new respect for the flag, that, that it, it, it invokes a, a spirit in them, um, you know, that might have them stop and think on why that American flag is something that represents our country and what it, what it means, the, the stories behind it. I'm glad that there's people still doing this. And before we go, we want to share one last story about one of Maryland's top lacrosse stars. She lost a big part of her life during the terrorist attacks on 9-11 and uses that as inspiration to keep going forward. Sharla McBride introduces us to Abby Bosco to share how she finds comfort in a piece of tape on game day. Abby Bosco's tenacity on the field is unmatched, something she says comes from within and from someone she believes is watching over her from above. Although I wish he could be there physically, I just, I know he's always there, um, his presence, I always feel it. Abby doesn't have many memories of her father, but she's told she's a lot like him, especially when it comes to how she plays the game. He was, I mean, a huge athlete, like a spitfire, everyone describes him as, so I just imagine what he would be thinking and saying in those moments. On September 11th, 2001, Abby's life was forever changed. Um, I think, Hmm. That specific day. Abby was just two years old when her father went to work inside the World Trade Center towers that morning. Rich Bosco was 34 when he was killed. Now, more than 20 years later, every time Abby takes the field, she keeps her dad close with a little piece of white tape. I had this piece of white tape around my wrist and I would write his initials, big RB, right here and I would put it on the inside so that every time I was lining up for a draw, I hold my stick like this and I could just look down and see it. As captain of this turf's team, Abby's play earned her a nomination for the Twarton Award, lacrosse's most prestigious honor. This tape helps to keep her grounded and focused. You know, looking down at it always does give me like a sense of, a sense of calmness, like I'm alright, it's okay, everything's fine, you know, just do your thing. Abby's mom and stepdad, who she says step seamlessly into the role of dad, never miss a game or an opportunity to tell her what her father would think of her today. When something great happens, they're like, your dad would be so proud of you. And I mean, it's so hard. I wish he could be here to, you know, see it all and say it. But she knows it. And those two letters on her wrist say it all. Charlotte McBride, WUSA 9 Sport. There are lots of ways to honor those who died in the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. From stairway climbs and memorials to even climbing a stairmaster inside a gym or watching the reading of the names of those we lost. For many of us, the events of 9-11 feel like they happened just yesterday and a lot of us can recall exactly where we were when the towers fell. I know exactly where I was. I was in Spanish class in high school. I remember it clear as day, someone running down the hallway saying, that we had been attacked. No matter where you were or how you honor this day, we can all pay tribute to those who died by never forgetting 9-11. Thank you for watching this Remembrance Special. I'm Stephanie Haney.